Recording in progress. Thank you everyone for joining. We had some technical issues in the beginning. That's why we're off to a late start. So thanks for your patience. Uh, it's now 740 and I will call the finance committee uh, budget hearing to order. Um, since this is also a joint finance committee meeting, we'll start with, um, I guess we don't have to do a roll call because we are here in, in we're present. So um, seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 members of the finance committee present, we have quorum. Um, and let's get started. So I will share my screen and I will ask everyone to save questions until the end. And if you have a question, please raise your hand. So thank you for joining us on the Finance Committee FY23 budget hearing. Uh, this work is made possible by a lot of people. So first, I'd like to thank um, my fellow Finance Committee um, members um, for their diligent work. I'd also like to thank the uh, town manager, the controller, uh, the assistant town manager, um, all their staff was just excellent and, and very helpful in putting this together. So my goal tonight is to take you through uh, some high level uh, broad strokes of the FY23 budget. Um, you will shortly receive an in-depth um, budget book from FinCom that will have many details. Um, if you are interested in more details tonight, please ask questions. I have the budget book on my laptop and the uh, spreadsheets. So I'm sure um, jointly among the 13 of us, we can answer any question. So I'll start with a budget summary, um, just high level overview then uh, discuss differences from the town manager's budget, um, touch upon revenues, key expense drivers, new positions, and then uh, a year over year comparison with FY22. And I think for the interest of time, I, I'll start with the year over year comparison. Um, the operating reserve expenses, I'll dive into that. Um, that is informed by our three year model which we are doing a little differently this year. And I'm, I'm happy to share the work of um, some of our finance committee members. Then a, a quick discussion of uncertainties and a brief brief comments on Warren articles. Um, finance committee has not yet voted all of the Warren articles, but we have discussed them. And, and I know several town meeting members have approached us with questions. So I'm happy to share uh, some preliminary thoughts with you before we vote. Okay, also I wanted to note that none of um, Winchester's $6. million uh, American Rescue Plan Act funds were included in the FY23 budget and also no elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds or ESSER funds were included in the FY23 budget. Um, these are one-time funds, and um, as much as, as we would like to balance the budget with um, non-town funds, uh, that, that wasn't in the cards uh, this time. So we're using all of our revenues and our um, some of our free cash, which I'll show. Yeah, so here's just a bottom line upfront summary. So um, I'm comparing the FY23 budget for education, municipal expenses, undistributed, and non-appropriated um, for this year, uh, highlighting the variation to FY22 and the variation as a percentage. 
So education um, has a budget of 61 million. 312,000. This is the schools and the vocational budget. It's uh, 2.8 million larger than FY22 for an increase of 4.73%. Uh, the municipal budget is uh, the second largest, 30.894 million, um, a little over a million larger from FY22, uh, increasing by 3.54%. Undistributed, distributed uh, 24.483 million. Um, an increase of 1.059 million or 4.52%, and then non appropriated uh, at 1.165 million, an increase of 107,000 or 10%. So this highlights the sum of our budget, excluding capital, the enterprise fund, the revolving fund. So the total budget is a little over 142 million, but this is a good gauge of how the different funds are increasing year over year. So our total budget is growing at 4.3% compared to last year, FY22, while our tax revenue is growing at under 3% or 2.82%. Um, we're using 115 million of our tax revenue, um, which is three, a little over 3 million more than last year, and then balancing the remainder with over 690,000 of free cash. So this is just the bottom line up some bottom line up front summary. I wanted to highlight the few changes to the town manager's budget that uh, the finance committee found. Um, overall, it was a very lean budget. There wasn't much to cut. Um, we didn't really cut much, it was just changes that were noted after the fact. So for the town manager's budget, we added 9,000 for a contractual car allowance, removed 25,000 for a study that had been funded with a reserve fund transfer last fiscal year. Um, and it was uncertain whether or not that study would take place. So that's uh, a decrease of 16,000. Then for the controller's budget, um, at the time that the town manager's budget was published, there was uh, an unknown retirement, so that saves 14,000, and there's uh, some mid-year step increases that save uh, 4,000. The assessor had a higher than expected uh, professional services quote for um, an extra add of $9,000 to the budget. The Conservation Commission um, is expanding uh, quite a lot what they're doing this year, which is great. Um, they're adding, I don't want to confuse the, this table, but, but they're adding staff. Um, and this table is mentioning uh, $10,000 of landscaping that they're proposing. Um, and we talked to all parties, the DPW and the Conservation Commission, and they agreed to move it to the DPW budget just for oversight because the Conservation Commission to this day hasn't really um, had much of an expense budget and hasn't done this sort of thing. So I think together um, they all decided it would be more effective. General services budget, small saving of $400 for digitization. Uh, the Historical Commission unfortunately did not get matching funds for a grant application. And thus, we trimmed the budget by um, $15,000 and then added $500 back um, for, um, I believe it was the trend for their recording secretary. So that was raised. Uh, Department of Public Works, um, there was a Scribner's error in the town manager's budget. And um, the custodian budget was $50,000 too high. Uh, so we reduced that, and then we added um, 10,000 for a higher quote, uh, and added 10,000 for uh, the Conservation Commission landscaping I mentioned. Um, so it was really 53,000, and then we reduced it by 20,000. So the net is 33,000 reduction. Environmental remediation, there was a minor reduction in the contingency fees, $500, because a lot of their funds already have contingencies built in. 
And then for the vocational education budget, um, there were two factors that changed the um, budget. One was a reduction of 64,000 for the debt service for the Northeastern Metro Tech School. As you recall, this recently passed um, uh, a voter uh, mandate in, in the 12 communities. And it was just an estimate of how much that debt service would be. Um, so this was offset by an increase of 98,000 for additional uh, students and their tuition at Minuteman and Medford uh, vocational high schools. So the net was an add of 33,836. For um, funded debt interest, uh, we received more accurate numbers. There was a uh, new interest added for the Lynch feasibility, feasibility study and for the transfer station engineering. Um, also actuals for the cost of Washington Street um, were tallied. And so that was a net add of 76,865 but the actuals for Washington Street were offset by an increase in state aid of $25,984. Finally, uh, water and sewer, uh, the assessments changed since uh, the budget was released in February and uh, there was a, an impact. So this is a, a reduction of 25,000 for local debt and the MWRA capital changes. So the net, you know, it, it all balances out to about $850 added to the general fund budget when it's all said and done. Now switching to revenue. So the Finance Committee proposes uh, FY23 revenue of $142,596,182. This was a slight decrease over FY22 uh, due to the one-time COVID funds not recurring. There was also a slight reduction of the town manager's revenue due to three items that I, I hinted, alluded to earlier, the decreased revenue from the water and sewer, increased interest on funded debt, and then a slight increase of free cash for the revenue portion. So the new growth revenue is, um, we agreed to keep it at 850,000. It's, it's conservative, but uh, and 24% lower than FY22, but um, we, we trust the controller's uh, judgment. And um, due to COVID, we, we realize that's impacted a bit. State aid is larger at 11.7 million than FY22, and the local receipts um, are, are positive. So it, it's aiming at 9.8 million, which is 17% 17 higher than FY22 showing um, more of a recovery from COVID. So just to highlight some of the major increases in the 23 budget compared to the FY22 budget. No surprise, contractual increases for uh, staff was the bulk of the increase at 51%. Um, and uh, the lion's share was education, about $1.9 million. Uh, also, uh, new uh, staff was added. That's only 5% of the budget, but $300,000 in cost in addition to OPEB and, and, and um, healthcare costs. Education, other costs besides contractual was around $844,000, and that was mostly driven by special education which has had an uptick in out of district placements and um, also just an increase in special needs students. Um, the pension increased by 8% for a total of 446,000. Health insurance, uh, 479,000 um, increase of, and it's 9% larger. And public works is um, 386,000 or 7% of the major increases. And lastly, general government um, increased by 286,000 or 5%. So the new positions that I mentioned, uh, just under seven. So the Conservation Commission is increasing its uh, agent to um, one full-time equivalent staff. 
So she's now at 0.71. Uh, the police is adding another half uh, FTE or full time equivalent for the dispatch dispatch position. Um, they have a half position right now and um, having two parties um, for this uh, stressful demanding job will, will improve uh, their ability. The recreation is making its clerk uh, full time, uh, so raising it by 0.2. That's no net add to our budget because that's funded through the enterprise fund. So um, the schools are adding the remaining positions. Uh, so for the world language at the high school, that's a net add of 0.4. Um, there are two language-based adds, one at VO for uh, one FTE and 0.6 at McCall. And then finally, four kindergarten aides are added. Um, so for a total of 6.99 and an increase in cost of a little over 300,000. And as I previously mentioned, uh, the new positions, in addition to this 300,000, impact health, health insurance and OPEB or pension costs. Okay, our three-year plan. So the three-year plan is important just to get a sense of, of where the, the town's uh, finances are heading. So right now it might seem we're we're very flush. Our reserves are at 12 percent and over 12 percent, 12.44 percent. And the select board's recommendation is to keep them at six to 10 percent. But um, this can be misleading because our expenses are in our operating budget is continuing to grow at and outpacing our revenues. So um, it's important to get a handle on this. and. In the town manager's budget book, she modeled three uh, different scenarios, um, or as she refers to it as a, a sensitivity analysis that looks at, you know, middle of the road, more conservative and more aggressive, uh, changing the assumptions um, as outlined. Um, for example, how much education is growing or what our revenues will be. So we did things a little differently this year trying not to specify exactly what these various knobs will be, but to look at 10 years of historical data and um, where, unless there's um, exceptions due to legal requirements or previously established policy, we set these values by looking at the average over the 10 years and the standard error um, and also excluded the two extreme values. And why we did this is to create a confidence interval of the analysis and basically to give you error bars. So I'll show you a slide on, well, on the next slide is a graph showing um, with 95% confidence, a band of values for the next three years. And these, are the other assumptions. I, I won't read through them, but just standard about contributory retirement steps and columns, all motions relying on free cash to pass at this springtime meeting, and um, maybe a, a two conservative uh, assumptions. One are that um, future free cash spending at all in Springtown meetings combined will be limited to 1.1 million annually. Uh, in the past uh, few years, uh, the controller and I looked at it this morning, the average has been closer to 4 million. So um, yeah, it, it, it could be more aggressive. And the turnbacks we're assuming will occur at 1% um, of the total revenue which is historically conservative. Okay. So here is that projection. Um, now we are at 12.46% operating reserves. And um, next year, FY23, the confidence band, uh, the 95% confidence band is between 8.3% and 11.41%, um, where the blue line is the projection, the, the median, the mean, um, the mean, not the mean, at 9.86%. 
And shown in green here is the recommended band between six to 10%. Um, and then FY24, um, this mean drops to 6.23%, which has a, a good probability of, of dropping below 6%. And then in FY25, it's, it's certain that um, an over, operational override is needed. So Sam, I see your hand is raised, um, unless, so if you have an urgent need, please go ahead. Um, otherwise, if it's a question or a point of order or correction, I'd like you to save it to the end. I'll save it, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so the summary here is that our confidence interval <coughs> modeling gives us 95% confidence that the value will be in this blue shaded curve. And based on what we know and 10 years of historical data, this is where we think we're going. And why is it important to talk about when overrides are needed? So. The former chair, Enzo Racionato, put this slide together last year, and I really like it because it just shows us what happens if overrides are timed too close together. And what we really don't want to have happen is to have the Lynch override, which is certain for March of 2023, to compete with an operating override because that lowers the, the chances of them both succeeding. If they could be spaced, if we could keep the operating override, if we could postpone it until FY25, so um, occurring in the 2024 timeframe, we think that has a better probability, you know, the late 2024 timeframe that has a higher probability of succeeding and passing than if it were brought in. So that's why we're stressing and really keeping an eye on our operating reserves, um, because if it happens too soon, if we spend too much of free cash, um, our Moody's rating, our AAA bond rating is put into jeopardy, and also the, um, op the success of an override if it's too close to Lynch is put into jeopardy. Uncertainties. So all the models I've shown you do not include um, extreme outcomes of the six contractual negotiations that are ongoing um, with the, the unions right now. Um, I, I've heard one has been settled, but I, I haven't heard the, the outcome of that and the impact to the budget. Also, the impact of inflation. Um, so we know it's coming. We've seen the food prices. We, we felt the pain. How will that impact our overall budget is, is not clear. Increases in healthcare costs. We, we heard um, Rich Mucci's presentation. We saw the trend. It's rising. We know it's real. And then the impact of new COVID variants. Um, it's, it's uncertain, you know, hopefully it won't be as bad or as costly as previously, but we don't know. Uncertainty in school enrollment. So this is 10 years of data showing the, um, the academic year enrollment um, over time for pre-K in blue, um, K to five in pink, which you can see is decreasing six to eight, which is steady, and nine to 12, which is steady the past few years. So we see this decrease, and it's not clear what next year will be. Um, I think uh, Peter Rowe did an excellent modeling job um, to try to predict what those classes will be, but it's it's anyone's guess, really, um, because uncertainty, there, there was so much uncertainty last year in how many sections we would need, and I think uh, that same uncertainty is there this year. Um, now I summarize the um, headcount of the teachers at the various schools, also over a 10-year period, and we see growth from a total education headcount of 464 in 2012 
to 636 in 2023. Um, and the Finance Committee was surprised at the maintenance of the K through five school uh, headcounts in this time. And um, I, I've, I've heard that there are different types of staff that are uh, making up these numbers. Um, there are different students over the past 10 years. So, um, but I think it's, it's unclear what the required school headcount or FTE should be. And th this is open to discussion. So small classes are good on the one hand, but bad, worse for budget. Um, so I think this really has to be this, a, a focal point of the discussion next year. Um, the schools wanted to maintain their um, FTE one more year and, and wait and see for next year. Okay. Now warrant articles. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we haven't, Finance Committee has not voted all the Warren articles. We did vote in favor of all the capital articles put forth by the Capital Planning Committee, but um, I know there, there's a lots of town meeting member discussion about articles 18 for the sports court and 26 and 27 for um, Carriage House and Parkhurst. So, um, I think overall, we are recommending a financially conservative approach based on the projections that I've shown and the uncertainty about when we'll need an operational override. That's not to say these are bad projects. Um, I, 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 would, I think we would all like to fund all of them, but it's just a matter of prioritizing and um, really evaluating all the projects with one set of criteria to see which is needed now and which could be postponed to, to a, a later time. So um, I think I will leave it at that and open up to questions first in the room, questions or comments, giving priority to our in-person guests. Okay. Thank you. So I, I expect we'll have at least one question um, from the crowd. Roger. Sorry. Uh, uh, so a um, couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, a general question. Uh, uh, with this uh, scenario that you've laid out, why are we adding headcount anywhere? I mean, it's obvious we have an expense problem here. Um, and so uh, why are we uh, adding headcount anywhere? Uh, that's a general question. Do you want me to ask uh, other questions right now or? If you don't mind, let me just pop back to that. So okay. here are the new positions. And so, it's, it's a fair question. Why are we adding positions? Uh, for the schools, it was their maintenance of effort budget to add these. Um, some, I, I think these lower three are special education based and um, they advocated that. I, I don't know if it's mandated but you know they told us look this is really important and also for the world language they said look this passed in the override it doesn't make sense for students to start mandarin in middle school and then not be able to continue um, the clerk is no net cost um, and the dispatch and the agent so they all made an excellent case and we we couldn't prioritize one over the other. So I think from FinCom's perspective, we voted a lean budget and we were really hoping to claw back funds from elsewhere rather than these positions. So FinCom, anything to add to that? Okay. Next question, Roger. Um, uh, with regard to um, the, uh, 
new growth um, forecast versus the local receipts forecast. Um, the local receipts being uh, forecast to go up substantially and the new growth going down. Uh, isn't isn't a lot of the local receipt have to do with uh, new uh, new construction? So let me bring up my cheat sheet for the revenues. And this has more details. So you can't see at home, but you can see here. One benefit of being here. So I have to just move my window. Bear with me. So for the new growth, the revenues are highly variable and they do depend on new construction activity. Um, the controller does like to keep this conservative and we, we support her um, perspective on this. And so we didn't propose a change. Now for local receipts, um, the growth of 17% is due to an expected return to pre-COVID patterns of local receipts as well, I didn't mention this, as changes to the fees at the transfer station, which have already been passed and I believe are scheduled to increase um, in FY22 as well. Um, and year-to-date receipts support these assumptions. And so that's why FinCom did not edit either the local receipts or the growth assumptions yes okay. so just to follow up uh, um, so the the um, the assumption uh, with respect to uh, uh, building permits is consistent with the new growth assumption and that, that, that's basically what I'm Sure. So I remember, I know Ruthie, you did the building and zoning and Al had great, or Janine had great things to say about the pace so far. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, on, on that, I don't know if you can hear me, Roger, and everyone else online. Um, this is Nicole Soto. Come, 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 come. Okay. <laughs> Watch out for cables. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. So the 850K in new growth is actually an increase over what we usually put in that line item. Um, it has to be conservative for some some legal reasons with you know how you report to the state. They don't want municipalities just pumping that up so that they can spend more and then it doesn't it doesn't materialize. So it's traditionally been, since I've been on FinCom, 800,000. Um, it's been increased this year by town manager. If town manager hadn't done that herself, um, as the person who was responsible for this write-up, I would have suggested it. So I was glad to see it. Um, we talked it over with comptroller. She felt it was okay, but certainly did not want to push it anymore um, with fear of, you know, not being completely aligned with um, the expectations around reporting and laws and, and how much you can expect to come from there. Uh, so the numbers from past years are higher because we had good years, but when we wrote our budgets for those years where you see 1.1 million, 1.02 million, we forecasted 800K. Okay. So I hope that, that that clears it up. So okay. we're trying to be so a little less consistent. So what you're saying is it's never consistent. It's never, it's, 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 it for, it's, it's low ball for reasons other than, um, yeah, history. that's, okay. I mean, you could call it low ball. If you look back, I mean, FY20 was eight, 820K. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're, our forecast is higher than that. Okay. I appreciate it. I under, understand now. I, I didn't know about the state requirements so far. So, one final question, uh, um, uh, or it's, it's really more of a, um, observation that the shrinking enrollment uh, does not um, does, does, does not mean that expenses will go down as fast as uh, FTEs um, uh, that we uh, you know we had uh, shrinking enrollment 
uh, up until about, I think it was right around 1990. Um, but what happens is your um, uh, your your staffing becomes um, uh, more senior, and uh, because you're not hiring people, uh, so the 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 curve uh, the um, people start to end up in the higher end of the uh, um, step and track and so forth. So that's something to be aware of going forward if, if enrollment continues to go down. Um, and, and did you look at the percentage uh, uh, of residents going to private school, which was mentioned uh, as a factor uh, by the in the school? So FinCom has not, and I, I'll look at me then who did the education budget. I don't think we, ourselves have looked at the private school enrollment. I know that um, the superintendent and the school said they reached out to parents, but we didn't hear back on those numbers, um, maybe because they weren't getting the response. That, that would be an excellent question for the schools. Um, another point I'll add about enrollment and headcount is that when um, the finance committee voted the school budget, we did have questions um, and we estimated, some of us estimated there's about 20% of play there. Um, so I, I think the suggestion was let's wait a year and see, and maybe then it could be more right-sized and serious discussions can take place about what that right-sizing looks like. Because as long as I've been on FinCom, I've heard about the, the 40 Bs and how that's going to increase the, the school enrollment. And it, it absolutely might. Um, but I, I don't think we can take it as a given because as long as I've been on Vincom, it hasn't happened. Um, so we know it's coming, um, but maybe it should be tempered and just one of the many factors. Okay, thank you. Oh, oh, John, yes. The history of the number of sections over the last few years. Sure. So, um, Finance Committee member John Miller has pointed out um, the, the number of sections um, and how that's changed over the years. So, we, I'm pulling up some of my notes. Yeah. So, what, um, we, we don't know the numbers for each of the schools. We have different projections um, that the Finance Committee did. Um, I'll pull it up here. So I know last year it was supposed to be, correct me if I'm wrong, 113 was the ask, and we funded 111, and they ended up coming in at 110. And I think next year, Dr. Hackett will um, propose a number of sections of 107. And, okay. yeah. Well, I, I thank you. Uh, and and um, uh, I, I hope you do describe this as uh, a, a spending issue, uh, an expense issue. Um, you know, we're, we're a rich town with plenty of revenue, but we spend too much. Thank you, Roger. Bill. Hi, Megan. Hello, Finance Committee. And uh, thanks. A lot of work here. So thank you, first off. Um, and, uh, you know, I understand the limitations of our revenue sources, Proposition 2.5 and, and whatnot. But maybe to, uh, to Roger's point, you know, these expenses just feel like a perpetual motion machine. We're not going to catch this. It doesn't feel like it. And, you know, knowing there's uh, inflation out there, some uncertainty on the schools and whatnot, um, you know, I would have thought maybe there would have been a trade-off with the schools of, hey, if we're going to wait a year for, you know, uh, you know, reassessing full-time equivalents, maybe we don't give you the new FTEs this year, and then we'll settle up next year. So that's just one comment. But more importantly, and I know you've described budgets as lean, and I don't deny it, 
but do folks or do you have a feel as to like what austerity would look like like how bad i i, I appreciated that one slide on if 2020 didn't go through but do we run that scenario and do we push back on these department heads and say give it to me and what does it look like if it's down five or ten percent I think you're on mute. Thanks for that question, Bill. Um, and I, I'll speak from my own experience. I, I've I've seen finance committee recommend cuts and leaner budgets, and it's it's not always welcome. It's it's pushed back. So um, I, I think it's challenging. I think we're trying to focus on what's the minimum you need, but I don't think we've asked what does austere look like? And if we had to cut your budget by 5%, what's the first thing to go? Um, I think we will start having those conversations in preparation for the next operating override just to understand what what's that next slide going to look like? You know, if it doesn't pass, what are we positioned to lose? Any other comments? Okay, Sam. Thanks. Uh, we did do just for Bill's question. We did do a little bit of that with the last override, Bill, where we looked at if the override failed, what would the implications be, so that we could help town meeting and others in town understand the trade-offs for that vote. Um, but yeah, it's always it's always a challenging question. Um, Megan, my question was more around your projections for the three years and where it leaves us from an operating reserve perspective. And one of your comments that struck me was the fact, actually, if you can go back one more, your, there you go, um, your assumptions around the three-year plan that future free cash spending at fall and spring town meetings would be limited to 1.1 million annually, but you acknowledge that historically we run more like four, which is my memory as well. Um, so I'm just curious if you can now go back to that projection slide. To me, that the implications are that that downward slope is gonna hit us a lot faster unless we really put the brakes on spending far more significantly than we have in the past. So I'm just curious what made finance committee comfortable leaving such a con such a low number in for fall and spring town meeting. So comfortable. So I thought you were going to say what what made you so comfortable assuming that everything would pass and I would say history. You know, town meeting is very generous. They like shiny new things, and I agree. we all do. Um, but this is the the financial outlook, um, and you have to be practical and and learn from history. So, our assumption is that maybe after multiple years of a but way above average spending that the austerity that Bill mentioned could be practiced by the town meeting members during um, spring and fall town meeting. So it's and risky. Even sooner, maybe even sooner, yes. That's risky, okay, thanks. And just to follow up on Sam's question, I mean, may, maybe one thing we could change with this projection is well, what if they spend $2 million? What if they spend $3 million? How much more quickly will it decline? Michelle. Hi, um, I think I wanted to go back to Bill's question and maybe it's austerity. And I understand Megan that you're keeping um, FTE solid at schools, but I think, well, and, and 107 sections is three fewer than this year, which is four fewer than last year. So enrollment is down, and it's been down seven straight years at the lower grades, and I've done slides on that. But I guess the concern I have, if we don't start to see those reductions in headcounts, which are not, you know, we're not laying off teachers for no good cause. We might have 
classes of a dozen kids to keep a teacher employed when we really could have one teacher in a class of 23. Uh, my concern is when we go for an override in 2024, I'm looking at your slide, that the story is look at all those teachers who will lose their jobs, when in fact you could argue that three teachers could lose their job this year, not because they're not performing well, not because we don't like our schools, but because we don't need three sections of elementary. So I guess it's just a comment that if we started austerity sooner and we we're actually a bit more right-sized, or to Roger's point, not adding FTE, it would be both reasonable, justifiable, you know, you could you could make the argument. If we continue on this trend, I'm concerned that the narrative two years from now is, look how many jobs we will lose as a town, when in fact we could argue we could have lost them in fiscal 23. Your budget is done. I've been in your position. The book is done. You all have voted. And I appreciate the work of everybody in that room. I just don't want town meeting and others to lose the, the perspective that we could be cutting now. And the cuts need not be as deep if we were being a bit more consistent. Understanding that enrollment is always a bit of a variable uh, number. So I guess that's the point I wanted to make. Let's not forget that we could have done it now. We could do it next year. But if we don't start doing it, we create what looks like an even deeper, like a, a steeper cliff that we're falling off of, when in fact, we don't need to keep building the hillside as much as we do. Thanks, Not Michelle. a question, just a comment, thanks. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, Michelle. I, I think cutting FTE is a difficult discussion to have, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't have it. Um, or, I mean, maybe a trade-off, you know, one thing that the education working group had discussed is, well, you know, if, if you schools really would like to keep your FTE this high, then please reduce the overall bill. Could you move things around and cut something else? You, you have funding that you can choose to use to cover some expenses this year, this year only, and then next year, let's reassess and see. Um, I, I don't think we've gotten an answer from the schools yet about what their plans to spend that on. So maybe that could be brought up at a town meeting. Um, I, I turn it over to Mia and Trong, our vice chair. Hi everyone, Neiman Chang. Um, just want to remind people on the FTEs that, except for the high school piece for the Mandarin, everything else is special education. And there was a lot of pushback when we asked, well, why all these FTEs about the fact that there were all these additional needs for the special ed side. And that was a very difficult multi conversation, multi-meeting uh, conversation. So, so just want to let everyone know we did have that discussion about the FTE, and most of that is 5.6 of the six FTE was special education related. Thank you for that. Thanks, Milan. Okay, um, next in the queue, Mariano. Uh, thanks, Megan. And, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I think, you know, we all know how much work uh, income is around this time of year. Um, I have a question on uh, on this slide. Um, I thought our reserves were around 14% right now, not 12.46%, which is what this is starting at. Uh, the book. <laughs> so we have our budget book, and the numbers are fresh in my mind at 12.46%. Okay, so that's um, all right. At small town meeting, I thought it was like fourteen percent, which was what was um, percent. It was certified. It was certified, and then I think one point seven million was spent, and there's been other things chipping away. Um, so it. Oh, so is this twelve point four six the what's projected to be as of June thirtieth of this year? Then. Yes. Yeah, so oh, that's okay. a better, so, so, right, right, right. So that's okay. the confusion. So it, it's not starting, it's not the um, certified number mm -hmm. that I'm presenting, it's the as of right now number. Okay, so the only thing that I would say is that in, in the past we've had issues with 
I, I think the 12.46 number could have uh, its own error bars <laughs> or its confidence bars. Uh, yeah. Because, for example, last year, uh, we sh um, it was shown that we would go down from 12.2% down to 10.5% um, at this exact same time. And then we went up to 14%, right? So um, I don't think that the FY22, that 12.46% is set in stone. Uh, so that would be my, my only comment, uh, just on the reserves projection, the, the error bars for 12.46%. Fair enough. Thank you, Mariano. And I, I think we, we wanted to have some certainty, like as of right now, it's this, and this is the future, you know, the past, the future, but you're right. Turnbacks can happen. And I think um, controller Ward wrote a nice report, I think, to the select board saying that the past two years of turnbacks were unusually high. And she, I think she said she did not expect or she didn't project that same level. In fact, and my collective memory will help me, um, we pushed to estimate turnbacks being 1% of the total budget, while I think she really likes a more conservative 1 million number, or more like 800,000. So, yeah, so. For us, going to one percent was being aggressive, but you know you're right; it, it could be even higher. Yeah, um, my comment is: I, I I look back down to uh, 2015 um, to every budget book, and uh, every budget book uh, projected a decrease in the next year, and um, we actually had an increase every year except for 2019. Um, so. That, that's why I'm commenting on that that 12.46% number uh, should probably have some error bars because we uh, when I presented when I was chair of Fincom and I presented uh, in 2016 um, I presented a decrease down to eight point something percent and it was actually an increase up to eleven point something percent so um, and it's yeah. been that way every year. So, so you raise another good point that that Fincom has discussed. Part of the motivation for doing the operating reserves projection this way is that we don't want to overstate the need to town meeting. We don't want to say the sky's falling. We must do something now. Um, we want, this is really just looking back at 10 years of data, we feel like it, it's more accurate. The data itself is telling the story. So that was one motivation, but you know, I'll come back and say, yes, the 12.46% could have error bars, and that would not be as pretty a graph, but fair point. Okay. Yeah, thank Pamela. you. Pam? Hi, um, I want to echo the sentiments that people um, said in thanking you because uh, FinCom is a buttload of work and often thankless. So I appreciate um, everybody who is putting the time and effort in. So thank you for that. I have a, a question about, um, and it's it's my lack of an understanding of the AAA bond rating. And I was hoping, and I don't know if you can answer the question now, perhaps uh, later at town meeting or, or privately, if I could find out a little bit more about the bond rating, um, at what point do we have to worry about when we risk losing the AAA bond rating? Where where do we as, as town meeting members have to start getting very concerned about that? And what does it mean? I, my understanding also is that it's very hard if you lose it to get it back again what does that mean for actual interest rates in terms of the difference and, and how that could impact our our debt ceiling? It does it impact our debt ceiling and, and would it impact, um, how significantly would it impact um, the, the tax bills that we have on debt exclusion or operational overrides? Thanks for that question, Pam. I know we've had, question, we've had discussions on FinCom about that, about what factors go into the Moody's bond rating um, and I think that's a good suggestion to put a slide together for town meeting. Um, so I'll speak quickly to what I know and what I recall. Uh, they published a summary um, stating their reasons for maintaining our AAA rating. 
part of that is, um, you know, good financial planning, um, setting up uh, dedicated funds for our uh, debt payments and obligations, also um, not spending beyond our means and maintaining that six to ten percent reserves. <laughs> Um, also, I think the sustainability director was mentioned as a positive factor. And I know I'm looking around at FinCom members. We read that document. Are there any other aspects? And Rich, please jump in, because I know you mentioned it last night. But one question I have is how often is it reassessed? Is it every two years? or more frequently, does anyone remember? Every year, okay. And then Pam's follow-up question was, well, what would the impact be if we degraded our rating and would it be as easy to recover the next year? I don't know, but we can look into that. And does can anyone I... know? Oh, John, John has his hand up. Okay, no, so John? <laughs> The other point that I think Sam's raising is interest rates are going to go up. It, whether or not our rating stays the same or grades or goes to But I I heard the question is can you estimate? Like is it okay, the debt limit. Okay. Arun Balu Subramanian will tell us more. Usually on the news. Muni said uh, this kind of credit credit analysis is we usually sit down so they can see you. <laughs> <laughs> so we do some kind of a structural analysis, and usually if you lose a rating, uh, it, it's uh, it takes a little bit of time to get it back. Uh, because they have a lot of other towns to evaluate, and there is a cycle, and then usually there's some structural reasons that you have to fix and prove to them that you've done it. So usually it takes um, maybe two couple of years for you to get it back. And also, um, the higher the interest rates, uh, the premium you pay if you have poor credit usually is also um, a little higher than when the rates. Are. So you can think of it as a percentage of the current rate. And so that that spread usually is higher. It's usually it's it's not a perfect sense. Thank you. Thank you. And forgive my my ignorance. These these interest rates, do they change the payment structure for existing debt exclusion loans? Are they retroactive? No. They would just be for future debt. So for future debt, and then would we on that future debt then be at that higher interest rate for any future debt we acquire at a lower bond rating? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good question. Maureen. Hi, thank you, Megan, for all of your work and to all the members of the Finance Committee. Uh, one area where I have or maybe some insight, but not the knowledge that would come from finance committee is new growth. And especially, I just recently did um, go take a peek at the two new 40B projects that are now under construction. I would think all of us should be asking what the revenue will be when they're completed. I assume these are, I mean, here, here's my ignorance. These are new buildings and there will be taxes and revenue coming in. And I would guess with the distribution of bedrooms that, and looking at comparables, maybe um, in places where these large scale buildings exist, places like Newton and Wellesley that would be, have similar school systems. 
I would assume that there could be some analysis of new growth, money coming in, and um, number of children and how that will play out. So has our has finance committee started probing the analysis of these two projects, especially now that they are under construction? So I think that would have happened in the education context, if any. So I look to the former chairs for their collective memory on whether or not this has been done. If I recall, they had uh, over to Nicole. Probably not. Um, so, Maureen, in terms of you know, like River Street, I believe that's the name of it. It's literally around the corner from my house. Um, that that was been talked about for a while. There might have been some estimates, but it certainly is not going to be ready for the fall. Um, but I don't I don't think based on what I've seen, and it's not included in the calculations for enrollment. Um, you know, which is why we're forecasting. You know, the schools and and we are using their numbers are forecasting enrollment to go down um, for for next year. So beyond that, I, you know, we haven't had conversations about what fall of 23 is going to look like with those new builds. Um, and as far as new growth, I mean, again, we've already increased the new growth number in the revenue projections. And for reasons other than actual buildings, we can't increase it higher. Um, I don't know when River Street's actually going to come online and start paying taxes. So we have to keep the 850 number as it is now. But um, when we look at those numbers in the year coming up, so we're right now we're looking at FY 23 for when we look at FY 24, when maybe some of these um, new buildings are going to come online, you know, comptroller and um, our town assessor, they know they're, they know about these projects. Um, and I think these error bands, they take into account, you know, these things. So higher, higher revenue that's on, you know, the, the rosier side of the picture when we can say, okay, well, what if new growth comes in strong year after year after year? That's how you get some of these higher error bands. Um, so that's, I know that's vague, but you know, that's when we look at historicals, what we can say. So those are historicals. And I would say now we have real buildings and we can certainly gauge what the revenues will be. It sounds to me as if it's probably going to be a little bit of a positive bump for new growth and then as the units are rented um then we're going to start seeing children coming in it's going to be an interesting balance because these are i mean we're talking about a couple hundred uh, units uh total that's quite a lot so yep. it just seems to me it's not premature as we're doing all this other projection and uh to start trying to get uh plug real numbers into those um the, the two areas the tax revenue coming in and the cost going out yeah yeah, um, Milan's going to come say more, the vice chair, but I'll just say, I mean, in terms of the error bands, it, it takes in so much stuff. I mean, there's so much that goes into our $142 million budget that, you know, if new growth comes in at 1.5 million instead of 850, that's, that's, that's great. But there are also other things that, that come in here, but we are trying to show uh, a rosy picture and a less happy picture with, with these error bands of how it could go. But Mil Milan, say more I just want to add more. I just want to add some of the um, projections as well as a comment coming in terms of the education side. At the height of the numbers, we had uh, 4617 for FY20. We had more than 300 students than we have projected for FY23. And even the school's projections going out to FY27, currently the projection is no more than about, that's 4161. So it's the school's projection as of now is keeping at 4200. But even if it did go up and the 40 Bs came in, at the height, that's more than 300 students that we were somehow able to have in our system given the same number of FTEs. And now we're increasing the FTEs. So I just want to let everyone know that's that kind of perspective. So that I'm not worried because that has a lot of students. 
three hundred that's not currently in the student in the system right now. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, Carol. Hi, I, I thought um, Maureen's question was an excellent one, um, and I'm not 100% sure I just understood the answer. Uh, was um, was she saying that the, the we have had 100, 300 students more, and therefore there's room within these FTEs to handle more students? Was that the answer to that question? Yeah, exactly. That was a great uh, restatement of it, Carol. So in 2020, there were 300 more students, more than 300 students in the system. And we know how they were distributed. So, I mean, if they were all at one grade level, that would be more challenging. So, and that was 20, 2020, so we're not talking, that was last year, you're saying last year. So we're not talking um, 2020, more than that. Okay, okay. All right. So the mix of staff and their needs hasn't shouldn't have changed dramatically since then. Um, okay. So I do understand that point. I do think the point though about so your feel so the belief is that these two projects. I mean, we are talking about two known projects that are coming online. They're not hypothetical, and they would fall. I would think not within the ten year. Um, average growth rate, I think this would be a bump, right? That's outside of your 10 year average. So you have two major projects like this coming online. Um, yeah. but what we can certainly look to see if that's been included. I know, I think some funds have already been received from those, but sure, we can, we can estimate if the tax revenue would go up and by how much by looking at comparable towns. Yeah. Yeah, you, well, I mean, you have done models that go out 100 years, so you could probably do a couple of years. <laughs> wink, wink. Um, so, uh, um, uh, no, I do appreciate, I don't, I don't mean to be flip. I appreciate all this and I understand it's hard, it's very hard to project. Um, can, can you just explain again um, that sort of methodology you used on the 10 year rolling average and it says, um, excluding the two extreme values. What is that? What right. is that? Sure. So you take 10 years of data, and if there's a really high number, so if your revenues were really an outlier, you would eliminate it. And that's just to try to get numbers closer to the, the mean. And that's a, it's a common statistical technique um, to estimate error. But our revenues would have gone higher than normal because we passed an override or something like that. Is that what you're saying? So you took those out, assuming that we might. That's a, one sort of, example. Yeah. Um, okay. And then on the expense side, um, did you also average out outlier years on expenses or were they? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So that's kind of get at. Um, okay. And I need to do a plug. Stephen Carp is yeah. the one who implemented this, um, a member of the finance committee. So we're and really that, were those okay. average, okay, so were the, so, and the, were, were they done at kind of a macro level or the average is done at sort of a detail level on, on the budget? De detail level. And, and so um, we have the, the roll up in our appendix for the three year plan and the, but, um, yeah, it's so helpful to have a three-year plan. I really, I really do appreciate the context that gives um, for all of us. And now, so the last question I have is, and I know this is a tough one. Um, it's very hard to project um, uh, what the contract negotiations will be in these. Um, is there what? What are the, what is the stance of the committee and? Thinking that through and projecting that, or or conversations with the boards that are negotiating those contracts, um, because it does always feel like those come to town meeting as a fait accompli, and um, I just always have wondered. And given you know that we are one town here trying to deal with a very tight situation, what are the kinds of conversations happening on the planning side of that? Great question. So. We have not dug into 
that to, to bound how bad it could be and what's our best case scenario. Um, early on, we talked about looking at historical impact and how much it's gone up. Um, but then we, we were distracted by other things and, and didn't follow that thread. Um, I don't think they'll all be negotiated for town meeting for sure. Um, maybe shortly thereafter. I'm, I'm impressed by um, the personnel board. They've now set deadlines. They must receive the materials by a certain time or they're not going to vote it. So that will help prevent kind of last minute assessment and voting and hopefully give finance committee and town meeting more time to review any changes, contractual changes that we will vote. And when we do override projections and when we did the uh, last override, we did make some kind of assumptions, right? In the, in the growth of those um, personnel line items, correct? So I don't remember what was done for the last override. It was, yeah, Nicole's nodding her head, yes. I don't know that we, we put in higher than it, than it had been historically, but then I think that some of the contracts came in high, even higher than we anticipated. So yeah. we missed it. Different but administration, we, yeah. We went higher, but they went higher still. So we tried. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we tried. And so, if, if that's sufficient, Carol, I, I wanted, I neglected to call upon someone in the room earlier, and it might be for an earlier point, but Giannis, did you have a question or a point? So for those of you viewing at home, um, Giannis's comment was um, something I tried to allude to, but he said it much more um, quantitatively and succinct um, that the types of students have changed. The special needs students have gone up by 150 in what, in K to five, you said? More than that, and what was the other number? You said 800? Okay, so our low, just to repeat, our low in the past 10 years has been 650 special education students, and that's grown to about 850 now. And so this is the notion that even though we have fewer students, we have different students with different needs, different um, requirements on how many teachers, how many aides. So that's part of the discussion as well. Thank you, Yannis. John. I was just going to add another way to say what Eva was saying earlier is that there are five sections of students that could be added to K to five before the, the class sizes shifts to the minimum size recommended by the school board, 18 for K through two and 20 for K through five. And there are 16 sections of students that can be added to the K through five grades before the class sizes get to the upper recommended number which is 20 for K through two and 22 for K through five. So what Mina is saying is there is room for a, quite a large number of students to come into the system without changing the structure of K through five one bit. So I'm sure you didn't hear that at home, but John Miller com commented on some of the analysis that the education working group has done on um, taking the school committee recommended minimum maximum class size and distributing the students that were there last year and the predicted number of uh, increases for this year. So, um, and your bottom line was that there, there's room for how many more students in K through five? 
Okay. Not every class. Yeah. The bottom line, not not every classroom is maxed out. So that that's another facet of this. Trying to see if it's not always popular, but could students be moved around to different schools? I mean, could that help Lynch? Could that help crowding if it exists? So that's just another part of the discussion, how to um, right size the FTE and the classes and the number of sections. But thank you, Carol. Do you have another question? Well, I just want to um, follow up on that. I, I always find those, I, I know having looked at these data for years, I, it's, it's um, very hard. Um, and that in, you know, looking at it on pen, pen with on paper, um, that the math can be worked out that yes, you have X number of students and Y number of teachers and you should be able to teach them all. Um, uh, but it not doesn't doesn't always work that well. It might involve redistricting, or it might, like you said, involve a different uh, composition of students with different kinds of needs. So I'm I'm still a little fuzzy on if what that what that math that I sort of heard halfway um, implies, and how the school committee would respond to those statements. Um, I I. I think is a criti critically important conversation for us to have, but I think that we should be, um, you know, understand that um, those of us who care about the finances and those of us who care about the education are coming at the this analysis from different lenses. And both are important, um, but I just think, um, oh, okay, that's helpful. This is, this is what I had in mind, and it's not in the budget book, um, but it was in the working groups and Mia Lin's um, education write up. So it's no longer draft. She's presented this. But um, so this is what um, John and Mia Lin were referring to earlier. So if you look at the very bottom, the school committee has a minimum target class size for grades K to 2 of 18, a maximum target class size of 20 and a tolerable, I'll call it, 10% over that max target class size of 22. And for grades three to five, it, it grows minimum 20, max 22, 10% over 24.2. So using these numbers based on the projected number of students in each grade and the projected section number, we've mapped out and rounded up, okay, how many sections would we have at the minimum, mid, and above that max target. And so this is how it maps out. If it's minimum, we'd have 101 sections. If it's a little larger, we'd have 91 and even larger, 83. And so, Milan or John, would you like to add anything to this? Okay. Yeah. And, and again, it is does. Wait, wait, just, wait, 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 Carol. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Can you come? Come, 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 come. That's one comment. We we do look at, and this year we weren't provided by schools, but schools, and last year we saw there were classrooms that had 15 kids per classroom. But if you look at the average across the elementary here in the red, you see 18, 18, 17, 18. 18, right? It's not even, it, it's all under 20, which is kind of the middle range here. So it's, there's room there. I know there's balance. I understand between the different schools and stuff like that. And it is the school committee and the superintendent to decide whether students are allowed to shift between schools to balance it all out. But there is room here, not just by numbers. I certainly have heard parents say that they, I personally know one person who's very upset who wanted to move, I can tell you that, um, and couldn't move this year. But there is room here, not just in the numbers, but in the students who might want to move, and it's not happening. So. Okay, thank you. Sorry to cut you off, Carol, but I know she, she wanted to make a point. Okay, thanks, Carol. Sam. 
So I, I think this is great analysis. I'm curious if, as you looked at this, if you mapped the various target size classrooms to the actual space in the schools. I think that's one of the challenges we've had in the past is we might all say, hey, 23 or 25 students is perfectly reasonable, but the classroom may not actually be able to accommodate that many. Was there anything done to look at the footprint that we have to exist in? No. Okay. So I don't think there's any classrooms that are at 10% over or even close to the okay. So yeah, because none of the classes are at that 10% limit, it's not that to be a concern. But, but what I think I'm hearing is maybe at the different schools, they would have more students. So maybe they would be closer if it's not distributed evenly. So. Yeah, okay. And, and the response is we're so far away from that. Um, it hasn't seemed to be a concern. Thanks. Sure. Great discussion. Any more here or at home? Well, if not, I'll stop sharing my screen. And a big thank you to all of the finance committee members for their hard work. Thank you for attending. Feel free to reach out to any of us um, afterwards with comments or questions. And I would love your feedback. Something Milan and I were just discussing today is how could we make the budget book better? Could we make it simpler so it's more readable? Um, so we would love your feedback there. Courtney, not necessarily now, but you know, it's um, <laughs> Oh, sorry, Courtney, you're on mute. There were a few of us who had understood, usually there's um, an opening for brief public comment at the start usually of the meetings, but it sounds like you're, are you signing off and not having that this time? Oh, no, no, you guys have patiently waited. And I spoke um, with, with someone earlier today um, about that answering. We do have public comment typically at our FinCom meetings, it's at the beginning, but because this was a hearing, we just jumped right into that. But please, um, I, I turn all over the floor if you'd want to make a comment for your group. Oh, great. Um, I think there there are a couple of us who would, is there somebody who would like to, maybe Betsy, would you like to speak first? Yeah. Thank you so much for being willing. Sure, yeah. Uh, Bill here. Um, Betsy and I have lived um, across the street for 25 years from the rec department. And I guess I had some questions about the free cash and um, how resources are allocated for things like the sports court or the lighted pickleball court. And um, a lot of the neighbors have questions about that and just want to know how that process works. Okay, so. The sports court is um, Article 18, and it's sponsored by the select board. And I believe the proposal is to use free cash for $200,000. Um, I can confirm that, but I probably will see people nod. Yep. So that's a proposal. Um, that That's for that specifically, there, there can be other methods of funding. It just really depends on who's proposing and, and what the objectives are. Okay, I, and I guess to follow up on that, so it sounds like the finances are pretty tight. Um, so how does that money get approved? Um, is it voted on or is it just, it sounded like you have a certain percentage of money that you put to free cash? Um, sure, sure. So. Free cash is used, um, it could be used to plug an operational hole as that's what I discussed for the FY20 budget. But in the case of spring and fall town meeting, um, warrant articles are presented for certain items and the suggested funding would be that free cash or the town savings. And so that would be used for the specific um, project if it passes. Is it two thirds for, for this? Majority, majority. Thank you. Yeah, majority of town meeting would have to vote. Okay. 
Thanks, Betsy. So I spoke with um, Angela earlier today. So Angela, would she would like to make a comment? Yes, thank you so much for all of the effort that you put into the budget. And I know that FinCom works really hard and there are lots of numbers and lots of people that you're trying to satisfy. So we appreciate your efforts. I think a lot of people in our neighborhood are concerned because it seems as though the rec department approached the select board directly on the Mystic Sport Court rather than submitting it as a capital project. So it hasn't been compared to other needs and other asks through the town. It's also allowed there to be very little communication and no outreach from the rec department until ironically today, there was a push email from the rec department with some basic information to the whole, to whoever's on their list, I'm guessing. Um, it also means that they haven't followed protocol for some things like traffic studies that generally get done at school properties. So the Mystic School is no longer a school, but it is a school owned property. And it's a little bit confusing to us because we're hearing things that are presented to the select board after the fact, where it talks about having 300 additional kids playing street hockey. But then we're also being told that there aren't any lights and there aren't any um, additional usage times. So it's a little bit confusing. So there's some questions that we haven't had answered as a neighborhood. And we think part of that is due to the way the money was asked for because it went through free cash rather than a project that had to be compared against other things. Another concern that we have is that there's no maintenance plan or funding that we've heard about. And this is a site that already needs maintenance. And so if we're doing a $200,000 ask, how long does that look good? And then when it starts to degrade, who's paying for that and how are the funds going to be allocated for that? So we just want to bring some of these matters to FinCom's attention because it feels like it might be one of those fast funding things that maybe it looks glitzy and it looks great up front, but we're not sure how it's going to withstand the test of time. So thank you very much for your time today. Sure, Angela. Um, I, I don't think we, we have to respond because it's public comment. No. Um, <laughs> If it would be helpful, so I, I believe, and I'm looking at a former capital planning committee member, I believe the sports court had been submitted as a capital article, and then was it ranked or voted previously, or can, can you come up and remind us? I, I'm again calling uh, a room follow Sabrarian um, to the stand. <laughs> <laughs> Through the last three years, whenever we've had sport, uh, sports courts, unfortunately, they fall off in the ranking, and that's the truth. Most of the time, there's always something that's deemed more important. You know, um, uh, we do, as we try to allocate, um, we usually uh, fall off the ranking. But specifically, talking to uh, the most recent time that that we had talked about the synthetic courts, um, what had happened was it was put in and it, in, in at the fields and we we had kind of questioned kind of like uh, one of the things that they had brought up is every 10 years we'll have to renew this so at capital they said well we have two synthetic courts now and and at six hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and if at a 10-year cycle that's roughly around you know one hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year that we'll have to uh, set aside if we want to keep replenishing them on a cycle, how are we going to fund this? So we had a whole bunch of questions in the capital CPC that we had asked the rec department. And as a result, they kind of pulled the request out of the capital ranking, you know, because uh, they thought maybe it'll, it won't get ranked as a priority. And, um, and, and, and then it was sub I'm guessing it's being submitted as a separate article or they were looking at other funding avenues for for that particular um, for that particular field. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Angela. Darren, your hand is raised. 
Right, yeah. Um, I have some slides, if that's okay. Just a couple. Uh, it won't be long, I, I promise. Well, because this was focused on the budget hearing, I, I don't feel I have to indulge you. I'm sorry. And because the hour is late, um, if you have any comments that have not already been addressed by Angela or Betsy, I welcome you to make those. But if it is similar, I ask you to be respectful of our time. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll just summarize. Angela did cover some of my points. Um, and first, I'd like to thank everyone for their ongoing efforts to improve Winchester. I think that's, you know, we're all on the same page here, and that's uh, our overriding concern. Um, I guess I was concerned. I'm a, I live up on Madison Avenue, 13 Madison Avenue, which is a couple of houses up from the rec center. And um, my concern was the way the project was approached and the $100,000 net revenue estimate that was made when they pitched the case to the select board. And there was a Zoom presentation on Mar in March to the select board, uh, which made the case for this. And basically it boils down to um, $34,000 revenue from actual court use by new programs. So 59% uh, of that use would be from street hockey, which would be a new program. And there would be 120 new registrants expected. And then there's 17, 12, and 12% from other things like pickleball and sports clinics and stuff, renting out for birthday parties. So um, that's only 34,000 from the actual court use, but the, but the rest of the revenue was supposed to come from uh, assuming that an additional student would enroll in each after school program. So that would account for 62,000 of the revenue that they quoted as part of the 100,000. So it's not clear to me what the connection is between, you know, a new sports court and an additional student enrolling in every class. Um, I don't think that's established in any way. So that's two thirds of the revenue that they've, you know, pitched. Uh, so I really think the revenue is about 34,000. And if you look at, uh, what that what that implies in terms of court usage, it amounts to about five and a half hours a day of court use if it's six days a week. And I understand actually it's going to be five days a week, so it's going to be more than five and a half hours per day of court usage. Um, this is my estimate. This is not their estimate. Okay, and this is strictly amateur based on limited information. Uh, but you know, if you if you account for 120 new registrants uh, playing hockey on the court. Uh, you have 12 teams, you have 10 street, cut, uh, street hockey players in a game and so on. You can add these numbers up and you find out that it's going to take about five and a half hour, an hours a day. So uh, that would mean that you have about 47 people coming and going each day or almost Actually, 300 people. This fourth court they want to so, uh, so I think that's that would motivate a more professional traffic and neighborhood impact assessment, in my opinion. Um, already Madison Avenue is kind of reduced to one lane a lot of the time by the existing use of the rec center. And, you know, we're, we're fine with that. You know, our kids go to the rec center and, you know, there's a community. But if you add 50 more people a day coming and going, I think that could be an impact. And one idea is we, they have a very nice mystic gym, which they could maybe use as a pilot program for you know, to see what the level of interest in street hockey is. Uh, people could come sign up for that and see, and they could gauge, do sort of a market study. Uh, it's a very nice gym, actually. And overall, I think we need a holistic approach to the Mystic site because building maintenance is a bit lacking and there are parts of the building that are in disrepair. And, you know, we need to think in a, in a big picture way about what the site really needs. So, Thank you, know. you, Darren. So if, if you wouldn't mind wrapping up, because I think public I'm comment done. is Thanks. limited in time, but no. thank you for your, for your comments. Courtney. You're still on mute. Okay, extraordinary amount of work in your financial committee overview. I, I just, it's a huge act of public service to be involved in this way. So thank you so much to the whole group for the work you do. Um, it, really, it's appreciated. Um, I, I live right next door to the rec department and have for 19 years. And um, I just think it's, there's a, there's things that have evolved, right? So it's good the building is used, but after school programming is a lot of what goes there. But now that there are after school programs in the elementary buildings, which is great because kids don't have to get on a bus and they can walk home afterward, maybe, right? And all kids who need those services can get served. There may be a shift in the population 
who's coming all the way over to Mystic for after school. And they're just, I just think the financial committee could help push the town. And I don't know how all of this works, right? But to really dial way out and look at really there's this resource. What's the best way to leverage this resource to benefit the town in terms of services and also to do as well as it can in terms of financials? Um, historically, I know that the kind of lease that was given one of the after school programs, which is a not directly affiliated with town was just just really dramatically under market and um there they're just i just think it might be time to really take that bird's eye view and make a long-term plan for how to best capture um you know things in front they come from that site to benefit the town it to me this this project seems you know i don't know what the analogy is but it's it's i don't know it's it's, it's is it like putting a porch on when the roof is leaking and there's you know it's 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 not it's it's kind of the cart leading the horse or whatever it is but i it just doesn't i and i think many of us just learned about it for the first time on sunday and i i so i look at this through the lens of educational programming quality town um obviously neighborhood impact but really fiscal responsibility of using this property. So I just don't know if there are ways that FinCom can push for a holistic view and putting a hold on this vote because it, the, it doesn't, it sounds like they circumvented some of the prioritization process. And it, it, it just doesn't sound to me like a logical plan. Yeah. We, we don't have power to, to disrupt votes, but we will as a committee vote in favor or against. So thank you for your comment. Young? Hi, um, I, uh, Finance Committee, thank you for serving the community and for your time tonight. Um, I just wanted to echo the sentiments shared, our, uh, shared by our neighbors because um, we feel that this project is rushed and we feel that we were somewhat intentionally excluded from being involved. And according to the newsletter that was sent out today, it seems that um, the uh, even before the funding was uh, allocated, they have already decided to go with Huntress Sports as the company for the project. And I would just want to ask what the correct process is for procuring such a contract, because um, we've done some home improvement, uh, uh, you know, the projects ourselves, and usually you get a number of competing bids and then to make sure that you best offer. Right? And um, so I was just wondering what the correct process is for that and um, whether this is, um, whether enough, um, uh, whether we know that we get, we're getting the best deal out of there. Thank you, Young. When we hear from the select board about this article, we will ask those questions. Um, we don't know at this time. Um, Thank you very Stephen. much. Sure. Stephen. Hi, uh, I'm Stephen Carney, uh, resided at uh, 10 Marshall right next door as in a butter. I want to thank you for your time, and this has been a very educational experience. Um, I want to voice my uh, my family's concerns as well as many of the neighbors that uh, it could be a misuse of tax dollars. And, and like other people said, we had no idea about this plan. It seems awfully rushed through, um, and I think it would be good to be able to get accurate information out to everyone instead of it just GM through. So. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. If there are no other comments or questions, I will close the session of the Finance Committee FY23 budget hearing. Thank you all for your participation and comments and questions. Recording stopped.